Good afternoon. All right, we're going to get started. Quick presentation on uh, understanding position sensing, resolution, and bandwidth in servo control loops, motors. A little bit about uh, MPS. MPS is a public company. We are uh, founded in uh, 1997 in Silicon Valley. Uh, $1.2 billion in revenue 2021, so good uh, size, 2,600 employees worldwide, and a broad base number of products. Many people know MPS as a power supply company. We were founded on that, power management, DC to DC, modules, but we're much more than that. We do battery management, uh, we do display and backlighting, we're big in automotive, all different aspects. And today, we're going to focus on the sensor product line for motor, angle position sensing. When you look at magnetic sensing, it's really an alternative to the optical sensing. Significantly lower cost than optical sensing. Smaller size in most cases. But the key is a more reliable solution, dust-free, doesn't impact, and more cost-effective solution. I'm going to talk a little bit about a new product in this space, and then we're going to go into understanding some of the, the key specs, performance issues that determine accuracy, resolution, and bandwidth. So when you consider an angle position sensor, MPS has some of the leading products in the industry. Our newest product, has a different technology for the front end. Instead of hall-based, very common technique for sensing magnetic fields, we use a TMR-based front end. And what does that do? Provides a new level of sensitivity. So as a result, we need less back-end digital filtering. And what does that do? That provides a solution that has more bandwidth, makes it easier to design in, easier to wrap around your control loop without having to worry about side effects of uh, loop bandwidth limitations. Also, another feature that this part has, it has no latency. It has latency compensation. And we'll talk about what are the effects of latency in a servo loop. And you can see in the plot here, we have a generational difference. Our first generation on the left, and you're looking at uh, the cutoff frequency versus resolution. Gen 2, this MA600, really takes it to a new level. You get an additional three bits with this new technology. Now let's talk about the error sources. You have systematic error sources and you have random error sources. First off, let's talk about systematic. There are typically three. You have the integral nonlinearity, okay, and uh, the INL. You also have magnetic influence, so magnetic uh, misalignment, let's call that, between the sensor and the, magnet, and the magnet. And then you have latency. Latency can impact that angle error at speed. And there are some sensors on the market that have quite a bit of latency, and some sensors that have latency compensation, like MPS. So let's take a look at how to calculate these errors. When you take into account the error from, just from latency. Let's say that you have oh, one part that has 10 microseconds of latency. It has great accuracy, but it has 10 microseconds of latency. How does that affect your system? Your motor typically has a speed. So let's take your speed, and then apply that factor, RPM times six, uh, and that puts it in the right units, and then your latency uh, is basically calculated out. So in this case, when you have a 10 microsecond error and a motor running at 30,000 RPM, you have an, adi an additional 1.8 degrees of error that you can't compensate out. So you, something to think about. So total systematic error are the th some of the three components. You have an INL. Usually you find INL in a data sheet. That's a static type of error. And you have magnetic error. That's typically static. And then you have the dynamic part of it, which is a function of your motor speed. Sum all those together, and you have some comparisons here with competitor part A 
and then MA600 has two different scenarios. Out of the factory, without system calibration, you get, about, you get under one degree of total error. If you in-system calibrate, it has a lookup table. If you factor that in, you can get that error down to within 0.1 degree. So those are the systematic errors and how to work through that with a magnetic sensor. Now the random error. The random error, the dominant random error source is noise. And resolution will capture that noise part. But as I'll show you with some of these parts, <coughs> magnetic sensors on the market, it's not easy to really understand what is the real resolution in your application. And we'll go through that. Along with resolution, you also want to consider the bandwidth. Because, as you can see in this diagram, you typically have a loop. The sensor is fed feeding back to a summing node. And then that determines where the correction is taken in the servo loop. So there's a, there's a bandwidth component to, be, uh, to understand. So when you consider resolution, also consider bandwidth. Now the challenge is, how do you understand and determine the real resolution? Well, you have to know some, of the, some noise factors. We'll go through that and understand the relationship between this resolution and bandwidth. So in that context, let's spend a moment talking about resolution. What is resolution? So when we measure, when we take multiple measurements, you have a true value, and then you have your measured value. And that measured value over a number of measurements has a systematic error, something you can calibrate out typically. And you have a random error. And that's your noise. The random error is your noise. And what we do is we typically take the six sigma of the noise. That's an accepted standard. You typically find noise in a data sheet. In a magnetic sensor data sheet, you'll find a noise spec. It might be peak to peak. It might be RMS. If it's RMS, you need to, do, you need to add the multiplier to it, to six sigma. Now, why do we choose Six Sigma? Because it captures 99.73% of the distribution. It's an accepted standard. Another way to look at it is if you look at, a, at, at two measurements, and the two measurements, the difference between the two measurements are greater than the resolution, then you can tell with one measurement and with 99.73% accuracy what that value is, that, that it's the right value. However, here's some examples when you're taking multiple measurements and it's not those two measurements, the sum of those two measurements are less than your resolution. Then you have some uncertainty. So when we take a look at an ADD converter, it has a, a resolution in bits and how do we convert that resolution in an ADD converter to an angle sensor? So in an ADD converter, you have the, uh, basically your formula is take the log of the full scale divided by the peak-to-peak -peak noise. We're doing the same thing. With an angle sensor, the peak-to-peak, -peak, excuse me, the full scale is 360, 360 degrees. And the, what, we're, what we do then is we take that same formula, apply it to an angle sensor, and you basically get resolution in bits is the log of 360 divided by 6 sigma, the noise. So resolution, now looking at the bandwidth part of it, typically what happens in a data sheet is you will see that there'll be a cutoff frequency. The cutoff frequency is typically what the system's bandwidth is for a given situation. Maybe it doesn't have programmable filtering. Maybe it's straight through. <clears throat> but you have a transfer function. With an angle position sensor, there's typically some level of digital uh, filtering done on the back end. So you have a resolution at the front end, which is basically the resolution of the sensing sensor. 
Then it goes through a filter, usually a digital filter, and at the output, you get higher resolution. Typically, that's not for free. You pay the price in bandwidth. So here is an example. We have our Gen 1 part, MA732. Its front end resolution is 7.5 bits. The MA600, the new part, is 11.5 bits. Now, to get to, let's say, 12 bits, that 732 is going to take more digital filtering. That's going to take bandwidth out of it. The MA600 will take less filtering. So it will get straight through with higher bandwidth. And you can see that in this data sheet, on the x-axis, we have resolution. On the y-axis, you have the uh, cutoff frequency. So let's say you, your application needs to be around 13 bits or more, and your loop bandwidth needs to be a kilohertz. Now you can't use the Gen 1 part. You have to use something that has less digital filtering, even though you can see that the part will achieve 13 bits of resolution, but it won't do it in the bandwidth that you need. So in this part, the, the MA600, there's quite a bit of programmability. Rather than one fixed uh, digital filter setting, we let the user program it. So now you get to trade off what you need. If you need more resolution, you program the filter, the filter window to what you need. An example would be if you need to get to, let's say, 14 bits, you take the uh, filter setting to, let's say, filter setting of 10, and it gets you, filter setting of 10 gets you uh, 300 hertz of bandwidth. And you can see from no, f zero filtering, 21 kilohertz, down to max filtering. You can see the trade-off, but it's much less than a Hall-based solution because the signal requires less filtering than a Hall sensor. And that's linked to the front end sensor on the 600 has better, um, has a much larger signal and is a cleaner signal with less noise. Now, why does bandwidth matter in a loop? <clears throat> because in the motor, how do, you, how do you know you have an error from the loop bandwidth versus, let's say, the error in, from the, the INL? The output, the result could be the same. It could, os it could be a motor that's oscillating. And you can see that oscillation when you plot it. Typically, you want to make sure, if you understand your loop bandwidth, that the sensor's bandwidth needs to be 10x larger than your loop bandwidth. Good rule of thumb. And the loop bandwidth becomes even more significant if you have multiple nested loops, which is also common in servo control. Now let's take a couple of examples. This competitor does specify resolution. They say it's 15 bits. But the way they tell you that it's 15 bits is basically it's the digital grid. It's not the resolution. So what you need to do when you have a magnetic position sensor and you really want to understand its true noise, or excuse me, its true resolution, find the noise spec. In this case, you can see they specify the RMS noise. So you take that 0.05, and in this case, because it's RMS, you're going to multiply by 6. And the, you find that when you apply the, the, the formula, log of 360 over 0.05, you get 10.2 bits. The data sheet says 15 bits. The real resolution in an application is 10.2 bits. Another example, this customer gives, this competitor gives the ADC's resolution, not what you see in the real application. And it provides that resolution depending upon the mode of the ADD converter. So again, you're stuck. You need to figure out what the resolution is in your application. They do provide peak-to-peak -peak noise. That is your six sigma noise. Apply that directly into the formula, and you find that it's not 15 bits in slow mode. It's 13.6 bits.
So when we look at back at the MA600, you can see that it specifies resolution, top spec, which is the three sigma, uh, plus or minus three sigma deviation of noise, it gives you a min to max. And that min to max is really a function of your filter sending, setting, your filter window. We also provide the latency. You can see that it's zero latency. Check that off. And your bandwidth depends on your filter setting, so we clearly provide that information. That's basically what we wanted to show you. Simple, pretty straightforward. Many of you may understand how to calculate resolution. I think it's nice to be able to understand how you apply it to an angle position sensor and then how you get clarification in, in a, a data sheet and in your application. Thank you.